Hi everyone, Reverend Dorr here from Faith Community Church. We are now in week three of our study, Why We Believe. I want to encourage you, church, if you missed any of these lessons, you can find them on our Faith Community Church YouTube channel, along with many other online services posted there. This week, we're going to take a look at sin, what we know about sin according to the Bible. Now, some of you may be thinking, <laughs> Sin isn't a very popular subject, even among those who say they believe. So why should we talk about it? Well, church, we need to talk about it because the Bible talks about it. As a matter of fact, the Bible records at least 400 references to the word sin in the Old and New Testaments combined. Sin is the reason that Jesus came to earth. Jesus came, church, to rescue us from our sin. Now, some of you may not understand why we needed to be rescued. The Apostle Paul explains in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Church, the glory of God was our covering in the garden before Adam and Eve sinned. The Bible teaches when they were in the garden, they were both naked but they had no shame until they sinned. Why is that? Because the glory of God, church, was their covering. Church, they were clothed with the righteousness of God. Remember, Genesis teaches us that man was created in the image and after the likeness of God. Man was covered in God's righteousness, in his glory, before the fall. But all that changed when Adam and Eve sinned. When they sinned, they fell short of the glory of God. And all of mankind after them are born with this same dilemma. But God had a rescue plan. God sent Jesus to rescue us from our sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus came, church, to restore the righteousness that we all lost at the fall. That righteousness, beloved, is God's righteousness, the righteousness that once covered man in the garden. When we come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, God in his great mercy, beloved, imputes to us or credits towards us the righteousness of his dear son. This righteousness makes it possible for you and I to stand before our God, who we learned last week is holy, holy, holy. Clothed now in his righteousness, we can stand before him unashamed. You see, church, because we are sinners by nature, we're unable to make ourselves righteous. The Bible teaches in Isaiah 64, verse 6, that the deeds of our righteousness are like filthy rags. That means you and I, beloved, on our best day, we still fall short of the glory of God. Now, the Apostle Paul goes on to tell us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, beloved, sin carries a death sentence. Church, for this reason, we needed to be rescued from our sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 tells us, God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When Christ died for us, he took the punishment for our sin upon himself. Without the covering of the blood of Jesus, beloved, we would be eternally separated from God. We would be lost and without hope. So what is sin? Simply put, 
Sin is missing the mark. It is missing the mark of obedience to God's word, God's will, and God's ways. Sin is when we place anything or anyone above that obedience. Now, sin comes in all shapes and sizes, but no matter what shape it's in, all sin, all sin is the direct result of disobedience and rebellion to God's commands. Sin originated with Lucifer. Created as the most beautiful of all God's angels, Lucifer lusted for power. He lusted after the very throne of God. He wanted what God has, and he wanted to be who God is. So he rebelled, and he took one-third of God's angels with him. And as a result, he and his cohorts were cast out of heaven. So understand this. Whenever you sin, you're actually acting out like Satan. How creepy is that? The reason is because sin originated with him. It did not originate with Adam. It originated with Satan. You see, Adam and Eve sinned because they were deceived by the devil and they followed in his footsteps. Satan brought sin to the human race when he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden with the very same sin, beloved, that he himself was guilty of, the desire to be like God. After God had commanded the man to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, tells us, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it. Remember that church or you will die. Verse four, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil, or knowing good and evil, rather. But church, what I want you to see in this passage Is this what God actually said? Take a look at Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, we read what God actually told Adam. It says in verses 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So church, the first thing I want you to notice here is what Satan did. The first thing that Satan did to Eve in chapter 3 was to misquote the word of the Lord by saying in chapter 3, verse 1, did God really say You must not eat from any tree, from any tree in the garden. Did you catch that? That subtle difference? Church, we know that God is not the author of confusion. Can I get an amen? He speaks to us clearly and directly whatever he requires. So by misquoting God's word, the enemy begins to cast doubt in Eve's mind. And as a result, she then adds to God's word. She says, God not only commanded not to eat it, but God said, don't touch it. But that's not what God said. So think about it. When she touches it, 
and doesn't die. She's then emboldened to take it a step further, and she eats it. Church, isn't that just like sin? Sin lures us in ever so gradually. It blinds us to the consequences of flirtatious acts. A word spoken in jest, a little cheating, a little lie. All these things, beloved, are seemingly small. But understand, the Bible instructs us to watch out for the little things. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, warns us, it is the little foxes that spoil the vine. Amen? Church left unchecked, These are the sins that will eventually lead to death. Remember, sin is rebellion to God's word, God's will, and God's ways. Church, sin is like a cancer. Sin spreads. Sin distorts our sense of reason. It impairs our judgment. Excuse me. Now, as I said earlier, the Bible clearly teaches us that Jesus came to rescue us from our sin. Notice I said rescue us from our sin, not rescue us in our sin. So I want you to know there's a very big difference between being rescued from sin and being rescued while you're still in your sin and continue in your sin. Beloved, we have to understand the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is this. Jesus accepts us just as we are. Sinful, broken, full of doubt, full of fear, full of unbelief, immorality. He accepts us in that condition. He accepts us While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But the beauty of the gospel is also this. Even though Jesus accepts us, beloved, just as we are, he doesn't intend for us to remain that way. Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17 to sanctify us, set us apart for God's holy purpose. Church, do you know once saved, through the work of sanctification, God the Holy Spirit begins to transform us from the inside out into the image and likeness of Christ. And this promise is made to all those who abide in him. Take a look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John, the first epistle of John chapter 3. Verses 6 through 10. So important you see this with your own eyes, beloved. It says here, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. As he is righteous, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Wow, church, so much to unpack here. The Bible is teaching us anyone who makes a practice of sinning has to question 
the validity of their salvation. Because the Bible tells us no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Now the term, listen, keeps on sinning, this is important, is referring to a lifestyle, a habitual sinful lifestyle, the habitual practice of sin. Church, we must learn to break habitual practices of sin that do not honor Christ. How do we do that? Church, we learn by leaning. I'm going to say that again. We learn by leaning. Leaning on the grace of God to do it. Leaning on the grace of God given to us to break these habits. See, church, you have to understand, you and I, we cannot break the habit of sin without divine intervention. Church, flesh cannot conquer the flesh. I'm going to say that again. Flesh cannot conquer the flesh. At its best, if you attempt to do so, you'll just fall into a pattern of behavior modification. But behavior modification doesn't deal with the heart of the issue. It just deals with the uh, external habits, the works of the flesh. It doesn't get to the core, the root of the problem. The root of the problem of sin in your life and in my life is spiritual. And so it takes spiritual weapons. Only the spirit, beloved, has the power to subdue the deeds of the flesh. I like how Paul Washer explains this. He says, it's not speaking of a person who's perfect, but a person in whom darkness is passing away. Isn't that powerful, beloved? Are you experiencing darkness passing away from you? If you're a child of God, truly born again of God's spirit, that will be your experience. As a true child of God, this must be your reality. As God the Holy Ghost transforms you from the inside out, taking you from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Amen? Church, church, we are called, listen, to walk in a way that conforms to what God has revealed to us about his will and his being. We are called to be holy as he is holy. Now, here's the truth. If you and I say we know him, but our lifestyle, our perpetual habits contradict his holiness, the Bible says then you're not born of him. See, when you're truly born again, beloved, you will begin to see change. Church, it may start out ever so small. It may take years to see certain things broken in your life, but change is inevitable if you are truly a child of God. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Church, we are to put sin to death by leaning on the grace of God, by recognizing that Jesus has already won for us the victory over sin. Amen? His spirit empowers us to just say no to sin. Beloved, do you know what the sin is behind all sin? 
The sin behind all sin is not turning to the Lord for help during the hour of temptation. Oh, we pray it. Every time we repeat the hour, Father, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But church, how about praying this very thing when the tempter comes? How about calling on the name of the Lord for help when that sin is just a fleeting thought in your mind? You know, God promises us with every temptation, he will make a way of escape. Amen? Yeah, that's written in his word. Look it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Church, God has called us to lean upon him in the hour of temptation so that he can give us his grace to escape it. I heard a minister once say, grace is the tow line to pull you out of trouble, but you have to take hold of the line. Isaiah 59 verse 2 warns us, beloved, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Church, understand, we need to take hold of the tow line of God's grace to pull us out of trouble. Church, our victory over sin only comes from Christ's victory on the cross. Beloved, know this. Only by placing your faith in what Christ has already done for you on the cross and turning to him in true repentance will this separation between you and God be mended. Beloved, if you want to live under an open heaven, knowing that God hears you when you pray, surrender your heart to Jesus. Recognize that he is the savior of the world. He died for your sins and he died for mine. And only through him will your righteousness be restored. Only through him, beloved, Will you be made what you ought to be, a child of the living God? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word. We don't take it lightly, Father, that we live in a land where we can freely preach the gospel and hear the gospel preached to us. So we're grateful, Father, with hearts of thanksgiving, we're grateful that we could hear this word and that we could receive it. We ask you, Father, as we stand in the gap for all those that are yet to believe, we ask that through this word, through the ministry of the cross, through the ministry of the reconciliation that you provided through your son, when he hung on that cross and took upon himself the sins of the world, We pray that that revelation be extended to all those listening and watching who are yet to believe. Father, lift the veil from their eyes that seeing they will see, hearing they will hear, and knowing they will know the hope of their calling, which can be only found in you. Lord, may these words from your gospel open the eyes of those that are listening. May we all be enlightened by the truth of your word to walk in a way that is well-pleasing to you. Father, we confess our sins before you, and we know that you are faithful and just to forgive our sins. 
So we ask that the cleansing of the blood of Christ fall fresh upon each and every one of us. Holy Spirit, show us, examine us. Help us see whether or not we are truly in the faith. And give us the gift of faith to turn to you if what we discover is not authentic. We ask that you lift the veil and cause us to come into the beloved, to come into his throne room unashamed, covered by the righteousness of God that can only be obtained by faith in Christ and what you, Jesus, did for us on the cross. We pray that blessing over everyone listening to this message today. And we ask you, Lord God, to send forth your word. Heal them. Deliver them. Sanctify them and set the captives free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, God bless you, beloved. We'll be starting a new series next week. So have a great week, and I'll see you then. Be blessed. Thank you for joining us this week as we study God's Word together. For those of you watching on YouTube, please subscribe and don't forget to hit the like button. I want to encourage those of you who haven't done so already, please join us on our official online church platform. There you can watch our weekly messages when they go live, as well as connect with our church family. Also, don't forget to check out our website at faithcc.com where you can receive additional messages and see our upcoming services. At this time, I want to thank all of you who have been supporting our church and ministry with your financial giving. Guys, you are a blessing to us. Together, we are able to fulfill our mission, which is to transform individuals and families through the gospel into empowered followers of Christ. If you would like to give now, please follow the prompts on your screen. At this time, once again, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want us all to remember, church, as we go through this week, that together we are living truth, changing lives, and loving God. God bless you.